This is the best Disney park. It has a volcano, the best high-tech rides, and even a full working hotel inside the park. And this is the worst Disney park. The best ride here is an inferior version of the one in Florida, and the park has barely anything to do. The lands don't have that Disney impact. This is Walt Disney Studios Park. So, how this could happen? How could Disney build the best park in the world and then one year later disappoint everyone? This is a tale of two parks. We start in the mid 80s. Disney was planning to open MGM Studios in Orlando. This was half park, half working studio. One of the attractions was a working studio tour that opened with the park. There were plans for expansion like Journey to the Center of the Earth, which was going to be a themed scene inside of the tour. It would feature lava caves and even an encounter with some kind of monster. MGM Studios was successful as a theme park, but as a working studios, not that much. Meanwhile, while Oriental Land Company that owned Tokyo Disneyland wanted something similar. They wanted a second gate. So the idea for Disney Hollywood Studios theme park at Tokyo Disneyland came to be. On this concept art you can see a big lagoon with rock work and even the Nautilus. The plans were later scrapped. Meanwhile, in Paris, Euro Disney was about to open in 1992 and there were already plans for a second park. Also inspired by MGM Studios. MGM Studios Europe. This park would be similar in some aspects to the Florida park. For instance, the Chinese theater and a studio tour would be available. But there would also be some differences, like the entrance. It would feature an enclosed Hollywood Boulevard because weather. This park was scheduled to open by 1995. Unfortunately, by the end of 1992, Euro Disney was in severe financial problems, and so this project was cancelled. However, there was an agreement between the Walt Disney Company and the French government, forcing Disney to build a second park. So Imagineers had to come up with a budget-friendly park that could be built fast and not as expensive as MGM Studios Europe. So Walt Disney Studios Park came to be a small and simple park with not much to do with. It feels more like an obligation rather than a real Disney park. Meanwhile, at the other side of the world, that concept for a studio's park evolved into Tokyo Disney Sea. This is where Imagineers could pretty much do whatever they wanted, and the results showed. But going back to Paris, Walt Disney Studios Park had an inferior version of Rock and Roller Coaster, Armageddon, one of the worst Disney special effects show ever. The Disney Channel building featuring Cyberspace Mountain, a simulator from the closed Disney Quest in Chicago. In fact, a bunch of interactive elements came from Disney Quest Chicago. The worst ride in the park was the Studio Tram Tour, arguably. In fact, the tour had to utilize elements from defunct attractions, like Horizons and the Dinosaur from Discovery River Boats. It also had Catastrophe Canyon and Dinotopia. Did anyone actually watch this? And Rain of Fire. Did Anyone actually watch this movie? The park also featured art of animation and the flying carpets of Aladdin, and also Animagic, a show. But the best experience at the park in 2002 was Cinemagic, a glorious show that celebrated the history of film. So when Walt Disney Studios Park opened, it didn't have a lot of experiences. So for almost two decades, Disney has tried fixing this park from Toon Studios, which saw Crush's Coaster to Tower of Terror, the inferior version, to even Toy Story Land and Ratatouille, which leave us with an important lesson. Built it right in the first place. Nobody wants to visit a park that's just expansion plots. A park needs something to do. If Disney spent a bit more money, they would probably be saving money nowadays. As Walt Disney Studios Park will be home to a massive new expansion, featuring Frozen and a new lake, so this will definitely help the park. The thing I find funny about Walt Disney Studios Park is that it kind of fools you. When you enter the park, you have this very good entrance inspired by Spanish colonial revival architecture that was common at the time when Disney was founded in 1923. You have a fountain and a pretty nice store. And then there is this ominous building, Studio One. Remember MGM Studios Europe? Well, this is that Hollywood Boulevard, our more budget-friendly version. After you enter this, well, 
you are greeted to disappointment. Everything just looks sad and depressed. Thankfully, this will change with the renovation soon. And after you exit this, you are again greeted by disappointment. And in 2002, it was even worse. There was barely anything to do in the park. So you enter this beautiful courtyard only to realize you had been fooled and there were only two major attractions. Rock and Roller Coaster which had the worst facade ever and Studios Tour which had the second worst facade ever. With the opening of Tower of Terror they changed a few things like they added Hollywood Boulevard which is too small to accomplish anything and ends up looking disappointing. I like the architecture of the Paris Tower of Terror better than the one in Orlando, but the ride itself is kind of lackluster. At Tokyo Disney Sea, they also have a Tower of Terror, but it's just incredible, featuring an original story and a lot of cool details. But the coolest thing about American Waterfront is that it has a cruise ship. What is inside of this? Well, some restaurants. Yes, this magnificent ship works as restaurant and turtle talk with crush. Now, this is just incredible. Another thing that is great about American Waterfront is the electric railway as it adds kinetic energy to the park. The streets here are fantastic with that classic New York vibe. In fact, this land by itself is already better than the majority of Walt Disney Studios Park. Don't worry guys, as we'll soon talk more about the best Disney Park and how it just blows Walt Disney Studios Park out of the water. Another reason why Walt Disney Studios Park fails is the park layout. After you exit Studio One, you already have to make a decision. There is no charming street or nice gardens. So if you head right, you'll find Worlds of Pixar. Worlds of Pixar is at an identity crisis, as it was originally Toon Studios. It had that Toon Town vibe, but as a studios. But it is clear that they need to invest more to make this a charming Pixar land. The area also has Crush's Coaster, a roller coaster that has a very, very long queue and also this weird mural. Walt Disney Studios Park has Toy Story Playland, which is just fine. But the thing that changed the park forever was Ratatouille, loving to tout le monde toquer de Remy. Yes, this land single-handedly had to hold up the park and was even cloned at Epcot. It features a very cool restaurant, which I like, and an okay dark ride. But what makes the area special is the overall atmosphere. But it showed something to Disney that this park has potential. So in 2000, 2022 came Avengers Campus, the start of a massive expansion plan. I am one of the people that actually liked Avengers Campus. It works well for this park, it has that industrial feel and it looks fine. But soon this park will look very different. We'll have a brand new frozen land and a new lake that will bring exactly what these parks need to make it better. Now let's visit the best Disney park in the world, Tokyo Disney Sea. Our journey begins before we even enter the park, as you can actually stay in a hotel inside the park, Hotel Miracosta. And yes, a room with a fantastic view and a Japanese toilet. The first land you see is Mediterranean Harbor. Get transported to different parts of Italy, from Venice to Rome where explorers and traders set sail, like Marco Polo. The major ride here is Soaring, Fantastic Flight, yes, with a G, taking place in the Museo del Volo Fantastico, Camilla Falco invites us on this incredible version of the ride. While similar to the other versions, it has a better queue. What makes this park special might not be just the major blockbuster rides, but the cool, small details that you see around the park, like this vine. It's not something that can be advertised, but it does make sense, especially when you're near a volcano. Speaking of that, if you are a fan of Jules Verne, like myself, well, I have just a thing for you, Mysterious Island. Get transported to Nemo's hideout inside this man-made volcano. Is this the best land ever made by Disney? Well, I would say so, where you feel as if the volcano is just about to explode, with the water boiling to the point of scaring you off, and the boats also add some kinetic energy. The land has two rides. First is Test Track, 
I mean journey to the center of the earth, a ride you just have to ride. There's also the incredible 20,000 leagues under the sea, an immersive dark ride, no spoilers here. You can also grab a bite of the iconic Gyoza Dogs, and if you are a fan of the original Epcot, go to Volcania restaurant, as it plays the old Living Seas background music. And yes, I ate two times here because of that. Next up is Mermaid Lagoon. Are you a fan of The Little Mermaid? Well, even if you aren't, I think you will appreciate this land. Half indoors, half outdoors, it's like a maze, where at some points you can glaze at what is happening on the other parts of the land. There is a big store here that's inside of a whale, that is a way of a tale to tell. This era is more for kids, with family-friendly flat rides, but compared to Paradise Pier, this land is just fantastic. Next up is the underrated Arabian coast. With incredible architecture, this land feels familiar, yet unique, full of little details and a double-decker carousel. There is also a theater showcasing a very peculiar film that is hard to describe. But what makes this land special is that it might have one of the best dark rides made by Disney ever. Simba's storybook journey. It has in fact a very interesting history. It used to be more dark and somewhat accurate to the stories of Simba, but then they changed it, adding probably the best Disney character ever, Shandu. Then, get transported into the jungles of Central America with the Lost River Delta. This is the Indiana Jones land. And Disneyland Paris fans, get ready because you'll find a clone of Le Temple du Peru. Yes, for some reason, Oriental Land Company thought this was a good idea. While I appreciate the theming, the design of the coaster is still horrible, but better than the one in Paris though. Sorry Disneyland Paris fans. If you are a fan of the Three Caballeros, then this is the land for you. There are also many hidden details that I like, like the C-3PO plane. There are also some great areas to just sit down and relax. Then comes the land that has a bit of an identity crisis. Port Discovery, imagine Epcot but about the sea. This land has an all red floor symbolizing a red carpet as you are a guest to Storm Rider. Wait, what? It closed and now it became Nemo. No, not Jules Verne Nemo. Nemo from Finding Nemo, which is arguably the worst ride in the park, but would be a good addition to Walt Disney Studios Park. This area is great for creative designs. This is like a vision of what the future would be, but from the past, like Horizons. They even have Horizon Bay restaurant that plays the Discovery Land background music. This land also has Aquatopia, a trackless outdoor ride with water to give you that illusion. What I like about this land is the art and the overhaul aesthetic that works well with the railroad on top. Backside of water! Then we move over to American Waterfront, which is kind of divided in two. Let's start with Cape Cod. This is where you find Duffy. Yes, he's more popular in this park than Mickey Mouse. But aesthetically, this land is great with the boats and the New England style architecture. Aunt Peg's house just looks great with that small town vibe, nice gardens and a nice clock tower. Another thing about this area is that it plays the old music from 20,000 leagues under the sea at the Magic Kingdom. Yes guys, this whole park has a bunch of old Disney music. One thing about Tokyo Disney Sea is that it's really close to the actual sea. You are very close to the Tokyo Bay and you get some really nice views. Crossing the bridge, we can get a look at the incredible ocean liner. It has a very interesting backstory. This is the SS Columbia. It was built by the US Steamship Company, owned by business tycoon Cornelius Endicott II. She is one of three ships the company made, the others being the SS Hausa Tonic and the SS Monogahela, however you read this. This is a fake backstory Disney Imagineers created to make this land more immersive. And in fact, you can find many references to this backstory throughout the whole land. And that is the thing about Tokyo Disney Sea. For instance, the Society of Explorers and Adventure was was born from this park. American Waterfront also has a nice park and the Tower of Terror, which has a great backstory involving this guy. Wait, he looks familiar. The Tower of Terror has a great backstory. After this disappearance of Harrison Hightower III, Hotel Hightower became abandoned and rumors started floating around about what really happened. The tower became known 
as Tower of Terror. Then, a historical society started giving tours of the tower, utilizing that nickname, and that's how we are allowed in. I let the ride tell you what really happened to Harrison High Tower. The third. Next door we have the mini Toy Story Land inspired by Connie Island. This mini land just looks great at night. My favorite part is how it connects with the story of trolley parks, which were very common in the United States back in the day. The electric railway adds great atmosphere to the land. Additionally, the facades look great, especially McDuck's department store. So this is why Tokyo Disney Sea is the best Disney park or best park in the whole planet. With its immersive lands and technological marvels, this park can easily impress anyone and the result is hours of fun just looking for the little details. And it's about to get even better with a new expansion really soon, Fantasy Springs featuring Peter Pan, Tangled and Frozen. In fact, this super large expansion will feature a new hotel, so this park will still have two hotels inside of it. So guys, we learned a lot. When you want to build a new park, First, build it right. Even if you don't have a budget, it's best to just get the layout right. In the worst case scenario, just leave large expansion plots. This ensures that the park doesn't have to go through major renovations like Disney's California Adventure or Epcot. Secondly, get the thesis of the park right. Why does this park exist? What is it about? Walt Disney Studios Park was never a proper working studio and barely a park leaving current Imagineers with a headache and many challenges on the future of the park. Like, what's the theme of Walt Disney Studios Park going to be? Is it still a studio or some kind of adventure park? Tokyo Disney Sea is not complex. Tokyo Disney She is about the sea. You don't need to be a Disney mega fan to understand what the park is about. In fact, Tokyo Disney Sea is so great, even if you don't ride any rides, even if you don't get the small references, it's still the best park in the world. Because it causes that wow moment, just like the original Disneyland did in 1955. In conclusion, I would like to say Walt Disney Studios Park has a bright future ahead, and the park soon will become better, with a lake and a nice atmosphere. And there are a few aspects I like about Walt Disney Studios Park, so it's not all doom and gloom. Now my friends, we have taken a look at the best Disney has to offer, and if you want to know what's in store in terms of expansion, be sure to click on one of these videos on the screen right now. See ya real soon!